Hey everyone, this is Eric. Before we get into the episode, just a quick explanation of what you're going to hear. Father Paul Turner, who is the Director of Worship for the Diocese of Kansas City St. Joseph and also the pastor at Immaculate Conception Cathedral in downtown Kansas City, warmly, generously agreed to come out to the parish where I work and give a presentation. And so this is a recording of that presentation. Be aware that the audio quality is not superb, <laughs> but passable. And so you may need to adjust the volume in places to pick Father up clearly. I'm very grateful to him for appearing at the parish and giving such an awesome lecture. Hey, go over to his website. Check it out, paulturner.org. You can sign up for his emails. You can visit his blog and see more information about him and his books. Check that out. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Father Paul, one more time. Now let's get to the talk. Hi, everybody. Hi, Father. I hope everyone's having a miserable Lent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to be with you uh, again. I enjoyed having some time with you in Advent. And uh, as, I, as I said, that I have happy memories that go way, way back with, with St. Mark's because I was here during my year as a deacon. So just out of curiosity, how many of you were members of St. Mark's Parish in 1978-79? Look at this. <laughs> you rock. <laughs> That's really great. Great. Well, it's, it's good to be back. And my, uh, our, my pastor at the time was Father Don Miller. <laughs> And the associate pastor was a guy named Father Jim Healy. I don't know if you remember him, <laughs> <laughs> but they were uh, they were great companions and uh, taught me a lot about about the priesthood, as all of you did. So I'm forever grateful for the help that you that you gave me in those days. I uh, I suggested since we were going to be in this kind of end of Lent time and just before Holy Week that I could talk to you about the, the period that we're in in the, in the church calendar. So I've, I've called this talk From Lent to Easter, Making the Most of the Year's Best Days. During this week and next, but especially next, we have some tremendous opportunities to express our faith together at church. And uh, I'm sure you have been through these liturgies at one time or another of your lives. I'd just like to go over them with you, point out some of the some of the particular features that occur, especially during Holy Week, and uh, encourage you to be ready to participate in them uh, another time. So that's that's where I'm headed tonight. As in the past, I put a PDF of all these slides on my website. If you want a copy of them, you go to paulturner.org, go to the workshop button, and yours will be on top. Just click on it and you'll see all of these slides there. If you want to copy them, you, you may do that. But they're only there for about two days and then they come down to prepare this presentation just for you. So you can have the slides, but then we'll take them down so nobody else figures out where they are. While you're there, if you want, you can sign up for my blog. I know a couple of people here are, uh, are seeing the blog, but if you have liturgy trivia questions, the blog is for you. If those types of things drive you crazy, then don't sign up. But, uh, but for a lot of folks, it is. Well, I joke about having a miserable Lent, but let me ask you, how is your Lent going? I don't know if anybody wants to share anything, but I'd love to hear from, from some of you, especially if you set out this year on Ash Wednesday saying, you know, I'm going to try to do this for the next six weeks, and you've been doing it, I'd, I'd love to hear a little of that, just how, how your Lent is going. Would, would anybody like to share with us something about what's going on with you and Lent? Um, yeah? I signed up for a uh, Pray More Retreat, Lenten Retreat. Okay. There's three videos every week, and they're priests, nuns, and various people and they're very very interesting great and i tried to go back and watch them at least three times all right so that, see if it takes yeah a long time to so you've been able to do a little extra spiritual formation during that great anybody else something going on 
I'm not sure how you know that. Yeah. And my, my wife started out really good. My wife retired, and, and we got National Women's Day in Hawaii. We can't beat that. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and, uh, um, but as I told you, Father, I walked in. Um, my family has a uh, challenge going ahead of us, and so uh, my brother's real sick. So everybody knows what I'm talking about. And so you never know. Yeah. Sometimes the plans are going to go. Yeah. Sometimes life hands you a lens you were not expecting to have. Yeah, that's what's and, uh, and some people get their six weeks of suffering outside of Lent, depending on some other things that are going on. Yeah. You want to hear about it? Yeah, I do. I do all this regular spiritual stuff. But one of the things I decided I do this year is try to get my personal space into, into not, not, my spiritual life, not my politics, my living yeah and so i started painting okay oh, oh my gosh yeah my my kitchen is <laughs> really I, my, I cleared off my computer desk this morning and filed everything away that needed to be filed uh, and i just wanted to put my regular life in the order because i let that go spiritual stuff's no problem yeah you know to do the actual but to do the personal stuff, I, I would let that go. So I tried to be a little bit more. That's very good. Something practical. Yeah, that's it, very good. It, it has been good. Those, that's a great Lenten exercise. <laughs> it really is. Tim was saying he spent Ash Wednesday in, in Hawaii, and I thought, well, who travels that far for Ash Wednesday? Then I realized, oh, I guess I did. I was. I spent Ash Wednesday in Rome this year. I was. Uh, I was over there for a meeting and the, some vacation days, but we we timed it so we we would have Ash Wednesday in Rome and then fly home the the next day. The uh, that gave us an opportunity to attend the Ash Wednesday Mass with Pope Francis that he does on uh, in one of the churches on the kind of in the city of Rome near where near where I went to school many many years ago. And it was really a beautiful experience. Some of you probably have met Abbot Gregory. He used to be Abbot at Conception Abbey, a little bit north of here. He's living in Rome now. He arranged for us to get entry into San Anselmo, where, where he's living, and where the Pope begins the Ash Wednesday celebration. So we were, uh, we were with just you know, maybe a couple hundred people instead of tens of thousands of people for the beginning of that Mass. And then he walked right by us to get uh, to begin the penitential procession over to the to the church for mass. So it was really a very very beautiful way to start the season this, this year. I, I say it's it's making the most of of the uh, year's best days, and Lent is kind of making the most by doing without. For a lot of people, we're we're giving things up in life, not not doing some things we've done before, cutting back on our food or our drink. We, we ac accept some Lenten penances as a way of apologizing for our sins and trying to reset our priorities, reboot who we are and, and what we do. And then when we get into Holy Week, we're, we're trying to make the most of what that week is through the church's liturgies and the customs. So let me ask you a similar question, just in your own lives. What do you like to do during Holy Week? Is there anything that you you enjoy being part of during during Holy Week? That it, it could be something everybody else is doing, or something unique to your family. Anybody share something about what you what you do during Holy Week? During Holy Week, I always try to go to all the evening Lenten services, and I just I feel like I'm getting closer to God with other people. Yeah. And it's they're always very unique. Yeah. So making a special effort to get to those evening services that uh, bring people together, they are very moving. Um, I'm just wondering, does anybody have a, a family that had Good Friday customs? I know, like in, in my own family, we tried to 
honor the time from noon to three. Mom tried to get us quiet when we were kids to you know, really observe that time as something very special. Um, it's um, you know, there's there's just unique days that give us give us some opportunity to do do something special with our with our lives. You know the the. How about this custom? Does anybody remember, or I don't know, from, does St. Mark's do it? Do you cover statues? Does St. Mark's do this? <clears throat> On Good Friday. On Good Friday? Yeah. Okay. Uh, St. John's I'm sorry? St. John's and Blue Springs. St. John's and Blue Springs? Have all of theirs done. Right now? Uh-huh. Yeah. There is, a, there is an option for covering statues starting on the fifth Sunday of Lent, which was yesterday. So it's a uh, it's an option to cover crosses and images. Most people cover them in purple if they do this, but it never tells you what color. You could you could cover them in red polka dot if you wanted, and you'd still not have a law that tells you you can't. But the but the long custom is uh, is around this. And say it's it's permitted. But, uh, and some people do it, wouldn't, wouldn't think of going through the end of Lent without it. Others have never heard of it because their parish has never done it before. But that's, that's why you see some variation on it. It was certainly a part of Lent when I was growing up. Everybody did it during the, the last two weeks because the, the last two Sundays of Lent brought you into kind of a, a special part of the season called Passion Tide. You had the first four weeks of Lent, you had Laetare Sunday on the fourth Sunday, and then the, what we now call the fifth Sunday of Lent used to be called the first Passion Sunday, and Palm Sunday, the second Passion Sunday, or Palm Sunday. So it, both those, and that's why the, the custom continues to cover the statues beginning on the fifth Sunday of Lent because of this old practice of making the last two weeks a time to meditate on the on the passion of Christ. Now we don't do that. We the fifth Sunday has a different set of readings and a whole different different approach. Something you may not notice unless you're really attentive at daily mass at the preface. But when the priest begins the Eucharistic prayer, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. The preface that he says during these two weeks is taken from the passion section of the prefaces, not the Lent section. So he's he's still got a little carryover from the from the previous calendar as the the optional covering of the of these uh, statues does. In in effect, the how many of you go to daily mass or follow the daily mass readings as part of your daily routine? So a few. Uh, one thing you'll notice at this time of year is, is that the Gospels all come from John, Monday through Saturday, and they're working you through the biography of Jesus, but plucking out the stories that lead to his arrest and crucifixion. Today, for example, the reading ends with the notice that they didn't arrest him because his time had not yet come. But you have this ominous feeling that goes through the, the Gospels at daily mass for the last three weeks of Lent. In a way, you could say that's taking some of the previous custom of Passion Tide and putting it into, into place again today. But that's kind of what that what this season is, is like and, and what, you, what you might experience right now. I'm going to tell you about another Mass that's happening in our diocese later this week. The, the Chrism Mass will be at the cathedral where I am currently working as the pastor. How many of you have attended a Chrism Mass at the cathedral at least once in your lives? Great. It is, uh, it's a Mass that I, I find a lot of Catholics don't know about, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you tonight about it. You should know that it's happening. It is a, an important Mass for our entire diocese. Every diocese does one of these. A bishop presides for it. 
It was originally celebrated on the morning of Holy Thursday. But after Vatican II, they realized people were busy. It was hard to get all the priests of a diocese together on that morning. So they allowed bishops to choose a different day. Many dioceses now do it on Tuesday of Holy Week instead of on Holy Thursday morning. Our diocese somehow started up the tradition of doing it a Thursday before Holy Thursday. So we, we kept it on a Thursday, but a full week earlier. And instead of doing it in the morning, we do it in the evening. The, the, uh, the hope is that people from our parishes could come, not just the priests, but the but the people in the parishes could come and fill the cathedral on that night as well. It's the, the main point of this Mass is for the bishop to bless and consecrate three different oils, and I'll look at them with you. Do you know what the three oils are that we use in the sacraments in the Catholic Church? One of them is the oil of the sick, chrism, and catechumens. catechumens. The oil of catechumens, the oil of the sick, and chrism. I'll talk a little bit about the three of them. But uh, each year, the, the bishop has a special ceremony in which he, he, he blesses these for, for the year. If this is a year when you anticipate being present for somebody's baptism, somebody's confirmation, someone's anointing of the sick, someone's ordination, like uh, Deacon Emmanuel, then Thursday is kind of a big day because all of the all of the sacraments, those sacraments that take place over the next twelve months, will use this oil that the, that the bishop will, will consecrate on on this night. So here are a, a few things about it. I'm going to show you the the collect, the opening prayer for this mass, because I I think if you look at it carefully. It will tell you who the, who the church expects is going to be there for the for the Christmas. If you can read this, let's let's read it together. Oh God, God who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ and Lord, graciously grant that in the assurance of his consecration we may bear witness to your redemption in the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. What is this praying for? What's the what what's the main verb here that this prayer is praying for? That we may be witnesses. Correct that we may bear witness to your redemption of the world. Now, the bishop says this prayer on behalf of everybody who's there, but who is we? Who is the we that this prayer is talking about? It's all of us. It's all of us. And I think some people miss the meaning of this prayer because there are usually a lot of priests present at the prison mass. And as we'll see, they are going to, we, we priests are going to renew our promises at this mass. So I think some people see the anointing and bearing witness and think that, oh, this is a prayer about the priests again. The bishop is praying on, on their behalf. But really, it's talking about the anointing that we got in our baptism. All of us received an anointing at, at the time of our baptism. And this is a prayer that, as a result of that anointing, which shares in the anointing of Christ, we may bear witness, we may live out that, that baptismal call with everyone else. So the, the first prayer in the Chrism Mass is for all of you. It's for everybody who's, who's present and who has experienced baptism in, in their lives. Then, after the, after the homily, the, the bishop addresses the priests. We are usually seated in the back part of the cathedral, behind the altar. So he'll uh, he'll address us uh, seated over there. He'll he'll 
state at the beginning that this is the anniversary of the priesthood, not like any individual's personal ordination anniversary, but everybody shares in the anniversary of priesthood on this day because on Holy Thursday, not so much you know, the original day that this was, was taking place, on Holy Thursday, this is when Christ instituted the priesthood that we, that we have today. So because of that, this time of year brings this about, he uh, asks the priests to renew their priestly promises. And it's basically two things he's asking them to do, although there's a lot more words surrounding each of these. But one of them is to be more united with the Lord Jesus, and the other is to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God. So in a sense, the first one is a personal request that each priest live a life that will be more and more united with Christ. And the second one has to do with our responsibilities, especially with regard to the Eucharist, the sacraments, the mysteries of the church, that we will be faithful stewards of these sacraments, and the, especially the Eucharist as we, as we administer them for the people. So he asks the priests to re-up on this every year. Again, another reason why it is helpful for us to have the faithful there on that Thursday at the cathedral so that you hear from us we're, we're recommitted. We, we like to do that in front of the, the people that, that we serve and let you know that we, we take, our, take our work seriously. Then the bishop addresses the people and he asks them, to pray for your priests, and then he says, pray also for me. So there are, there are two petitions here, one for all the priests and one for the bishop. He's humbly asking all of you to say a prayer for him. And then his other intention is that the Lord may keep us all in his charity. We might find ourselves closer one to another. We'll see when we look at the Holy Thursday liturgy that this is a a theme of the of the Eucharist that Jesus gives us at the Last Supper. He commands the disciples to love one another at, at that meal as well. So here too, as we're in this time of year, the spirit of Holy Thursday, we're praying that we could we could have charity. So this is this is a fairly new feature in the Chrism Mass, the renewal of promises and the request that the people pray for the priests and, and pray for their bishop. So again, it's another reason why it helps us if you're there. So we know you will do this because we, we rely on your prayers and you can be there and join in the, the prayers of, of the other people who've gathered together. That's, that's very affirming for, for all of us. Then comes the, the procession of the oils. Uh, now you can imagine we've got to have some pretty big jars for all the oil that's going to be used in all the parishes throughout our diocese because these huge jars are going to be blessed and then we've got worker bees over at the Catholic Center once they're blessed pouring these into smaller containers so that we've got copies or, or uh, uh, vessels that we can bring home ap after the chrism mass and, and use them for the Easter Vigil and for the other, the other ceremonies of, of the year. There's a, a traditional chant that we sing on this night, O Redeemer, hear your people, and it's got verses that pertain to the, to the oils. And then the deacons carry in these vessels. So it takes, the vessels are so large, it takes a couple of deacons to do each of them. Because I have nothing else to do during Holy Week, I usually wake up on Holy Thursday morning around 3 o'clock, turn on the TV, and watch this ceremony at St. Peter's in Vatican City. It is, the, the vessels they use are so large that they are brought in on carts. They wheel them up the aisle, deacons on either side. They're, they're beautiful vessels, but this... The Pope is going to pray over all, all three of them. So it's, it's, an impressive, it's an impressive ceremony to, to see. 
So the first one is the oil of the sick. Uh, perhaps there are people here in the room tonight who have been anointed with the oil of the sick. Very likely, the oil that the priest used for you was blessed by the bishop at the previous prison mass. If the priest runs out of oil, he is authorized to bless new oil of the sick himself just before he anoints you. But rarely do I hear of guys doing this. We've generally got enough of the oil to go around that we can share it. The leftover oil we keep at the cathedral and occasionally we get a request from someone to refill a bottle and we can, we can accommodate them at, at the cathedral. Well, as you can imagine, this prayer that the, that the bishop says is going to bless the oil and he prays that everyone anointed with this oil may be freed from all pain, all infirmity, and all sickness. So it's, a, you know, it's a beautiful prayer. The bishop is already praying this Thursday night for everybody who's going to be anointed with this oil throughout the coming year. Then the, the, the second one is the oil of catechisms. We, we use this oil for a, a couple of different celebrations but the prayer, as, as you'll see here in a moment, is really more about adult catechisms. But this is one of the oils we may use in the baptism of a child. So if, if an infant is, is being baptized, before we say, I baptize you, we have the option of anointing the child with the oil of catechisms. It's not is the priest or the deacon who's doing the baptizing can decide personally on the spot, I'll use it for this child, I won't use it next week. They, there's no rule governing it overall. Uh, in our country, they just let the, let the priest or deacon make the choice himself. But it's also available to be used for adult catechisms. Now, these are people who were never baptized in their in their younger days but now as adults or if they are children beyond first communion age at first communion age or older then they can receive all three initiation sacraments at the Easter vigil baptism confirmation and first communion so that category if they've never been baptized before those adults may be anointed with the oil of catechumens one or more times during the period of the catechumenate before they come forward to be baptized and begin, begin their whole celebration of, of Lent. I like to do it at least once a year with, uh, with my catechumens, but we're, we're allowed to do it more often. And in fact, even if one catechumen feels like they need a little extra prayer, a little extra boost, then a deacon or a priest may anoint that one and an extra time is to give them some, some support from the church. So the bishop says this prayer. Uh, he prays for God to grant courage to the catechumens so that receiving divine wisdom and power, they may understand more deeply the gospel of your Christ. They may undertake with a generous heart the labors of the Christian life and rejoice to be born anew. So it's praying for three different things. One is that they will understand the gospel better, that they will be generous in doing what we expect Christians to do, and that they will rejoice when they are baptized and, and born anew. So this is, again, already the bishop is praying for those who are going to be admitted to the catechumenate next year. That's when, when this oil will be one, one thing I didn't point out is that the, the, the English translation that you're seeing on the screen today is brand new. It's, it's, it's like about a month old. The books just came out 
uh, that recently. This is the first year that all the bishops of the United States will be able to use this revised translation in English for the for the chrism mass. So if you can go this year, you'll hear the, the new translation for the, for the very first time. Then the, uh, the third oil is sacred chrism. Traditionally, all three of these oils are an olive oil. T today, the church permits us to use any vegetable oil. As you can imagine, there are parts of the world where olive oil is pretty hard to come by and would be extremely expensive to purchase. So if it's easier there to get a soy oil or corn oil or you know, any, any kind of vegetable oil, it is permitted to use it in place of an olive oil. Here we're, we're able to get olive oil at a pretty reasonable price, so we, we do use it for all three oils in, in our diocese. Then the, the difference with chrism is this is, an, this is an oil that's going to be used for some of the most sublime celebrations in the church year. Baptism, confirmation, the ordination of priests, the ordination of a bishop, the, uh, the anointing of the walls of a new church, the anointing of the top of, of a new altar. It's very rare that chrism is used and it is used in ceremonies that happen once. So you, it's it's not like um, it's not like going to confession, which you do multiple times, or even receiving communion multiple times. Chrism is associated with the sacraments that happen once, or the consecration of a church that happens once. That's it's it's like it's got an extra power that just sticks in and stays. So we, whereas we, we talk about what the bishop does with the first two as blessing the oils, this oil, we say, he consecrates. It's the same verb we use to describe the consecration at the Mass with the bread and the wine. He consecrates chrism to make it a very special oil, especially powerful in, in the work that it is, it is called to do. Does the word chrism have it? Meaning? It's it's of course related to the word Christ. You can tell by the spelling of it, and it it, it originally means anointed with uh, uh, oil. So the the uh, the word Christ means anointed one. So chrism comes from that that same root, but because it's the most sublime of the oils, it, it has that kind of an elevated tech, uh, terminology. So to make it special, we add perfume to this oil. Now, traditionally, the, the perfume is balsam. The, 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 uh, I guess it's a gum or a secretion from a, from a balsam tree. But it's, it, it is, it's very aromatic. And, and again, we're not required to use balsam anymore. We can use some other kind of perfume if that's easier to get. And what you'll, you'll see here in this photo the bishop will take the smaller vessel of this dark perfume, this liquid perfume, and pour it into the olive oil. And then he'll often take a, a, a stick or a spoon and mix it all up. And when he says the prayer, he has the option of blowing onto the, the oil uh, to kind of add the the breath of the Holy Spirit onto it, making it especially holy. That, that blowing onto the oil is not obligatory, but virtually every bishop I've talked to does it. They, they like doing it. It's, it's a traditional thing that has been, this has been a part of the ceremony, and they've, they've all kept it. Most of them do it in the sign of the cross, but that's not in there anymore. It just says you can just blow on it, but most of them still do the old, the old version. All right. Yeah. Is, there, is there a connection? You mentioned all those options for oils. They're all plant based. Uh, is, is this tied in somewhere? Could it absolutely not be an animal oil of some kind? That's correct. It can't be an animal oil. 
Someone asked me about this once from a remote part of the world. I don't remember if it was Australia or New Zealand. They asked me, could something be used for olive oil? I had to look it up. I, I didn't even know if it was a plant or an animal. Yeah. But, but that's generally how the breakdown goes. It, it has to be a plant oil. Yeah. 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 And that's a new rule. Is it prior to Vatican II, it was olive oil, period. Even if you lived on the South Pole, you had to get olive oil for any of these meetings. So here's the, the prayer that the bishop says. It highlights uh, some of these when he introduces it. He's, he asks the people to pray that all who are outwardly anointed with this chrism may be inwardly transformed and come to share in, in eternal salvation. That's, that's the prayer that the chrism will sink in and, and have this, this permanent effect for them. And then in the, there are two options for this prayer that, that he can say. One is the old traditional one, and the other was newly composed after the council. Bishop Johnston likes the first one, and uh, this is a, an expression from it, that he's praying that people may become partakers of eternal life and sharers in heavenly glory. So you're thinking, especially of those baptized who are going to be anointed with prism for the very first time, that through this anointing, this permanent gift, kind of a seal that's, that's put onto them with, with this prism, they will then be prepared for eternal glory at, at the end of their days. Then the Mass goes on as usual. Let me, let me pause there and see if you have any questions, comments, or observations about the prism. What do the churches do when they're left over oil? I'm sorry, what is that? What do the churches all do with their leftover oil? Oh, when there's, yeah, that's a good question. If there's leftover oil, traditionally we put it into the Easter fire. So when, uh, whatever whatever we have left over, it'll, it'll go into that, that fire that is then blessed for the Easter. Okay, well, let's look at some of the other ceremonies of Holy Week. Palm Sunday is called, its formal title is Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. Uh, just like Good Friday, the formal title is Good Friday of the Lord's Passion. And even in the days when we talk about these as Passion Sundays, the the big thing about this celebration is the proclamation of the passion of Jesus Christ. I know everybody wants a palm branch to take home, which is the reason attendance is so good on Palm Sunday. But, but as important as all that is, the church really wants you to hear one of the accounts of the death of Jesus Christ. Mass is always long on Palm Sunday, but I find almost nobody complains about it. They, they know that there is something solemn about this day, and we have to honor it. I really think the main reason we hear the Passion on Palm Sunday, even though you're going to hear it, hear John's version of it on Good Friday, is that everybody knows not everybody's going to come on Good Friday to hear the Passion. But they want everyone to hear the Passion, and there's a better shot if they do, do it on Sunday, so you'll, you'll hear the story, and then you come back next Sunday, and it'll be Easter. But without it, you, you're really missing out on what, what Easter implies. So its title is Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. The, the liturgy speaks about this day as a commemoration. It, that is, it's not just a, a history lesson. These are the things that happened on this day. We're not... We're not recreating history, but we're entering into Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem as if it's happening now. Because, in a sense, it is. He is eternally present to us, and when we enter into this ritual, into this commemoration, we are partaking in his 
Palm Sunday procession from, from the, the last week of his own life. Here's what, uh, here's what it says about the palm branches. Uh, the, the priest gives an, an introduction at the beginning. Since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. With all faith and devotion, let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation, following in his footsteps, so that, being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in his resurrection and in his life. So a couple of things here the priest says at the very beginning that are, that are noteworthy. One is, he's looking back on Lent, and he presumes that everybody has been keeping Lent in some way, through penance, through works of charity, towards somebody else. But all of your work so far in Lent is coming to a head as we, as we enter into the world. And then, he says, we're going to commemorate, here's that, that word again, we're going to commemorate this this uh, event in Jesus' life by walking in his footsteps and sharing in his cross so that we can also share in the resurrection. Our Lenten penances are one way that we share in the cross of, of Jesus Christ and when Easter comes, we will share his resurrection as well. The palm branches are supposed to be distributed as you walk into church and then you have them in hand for the blessing. It didn't used to be this way prior to the council. They blessed them first, and then they passed them. You can read stories of priests who were like throwing the palm branches over to the people because the crowd was so large, but now you can get it, get it on the way in. Before I talk about the slide of the Passion, let me just say a word about the first two readings that take place on Palm Sunday. The, the first reading is from Isaiah. There are four passages from Isaiah called the Servant Songs. They're from the very last part of that book. And each of the four of them serves as a kind of prophecy for the coming of Jesus Christ. When you, when you read those four uh, songs in Isaiah Canticles, you can, you can figure it out. You, know, you go, oh my gosh, I've, I've heard these before, and yes, these are the things that foreshadow the coming of Jesus, and especially by the time you get to the fourth one, it's a suffering canticle, the one, one in which that shows how the servant has suffered greatly. During the Holy Week, if you follow the daily masses, you hear the four songs of the, of the servant on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Good Friday. They all show up in the readings of daily mass. Well, of course, on Good Friday, it's the, it's the celebration of the Lord's Passion. But those first three, three weekdays at mass, and then on Good Friday, you get the four songs of the suffering servant. So I believe it's the third one that becomes the first reading on Palm Sunday. So that you hear at least the third one on Palm Sunday and the fourth one on, on Good Friday. It used to be a different reading, a different Old Testament reading from, from Isaiah on Palm Sunday, but after the council, they, they switched this around. And so that particular reading is one of the newest ones in the lecture. But the second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. These are the same readings every year on Palm Sunday. You're familiar with a three-year cycle of, of readings on Sundays uh, from, from our lectionary, but Palm Sunday, it's the same every year. You always get that passage from Isaiah. You always get Philippians. And the, the, the passage is one you know very well. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave of human likeness so that God could raise him on high and his name would be above every other name. It's a, it's a passage you'll you'll recognize when you hear it. That passage is associated with Palm Sunday 
throughout the entire history of our church. The earliest record of a lectionary that we have, you know, what, what readings were used on what days. The earliest record is a, is a book called the Wordsworth Lectionary from the fifth century. And on Palm Sunday, they assigned to that day the reading from Philippians. So when you hear the second reading this coming weekend, you are hearing a reading that every faithful Christian has heard on Palm Sunday for 1,600 years or more. It's the same one every year. We are, we're, we're, we're participating in that long, long tradition. Now, with regard to the Passion, uh, it used to be that every year we heard Matthew, his version of the Passion, on Palm Sunday. But now the rule is that it rotates from year to year. So year A is Matthew, B is Mark, and this year we will hear Luke's account of the, of the Passion. It's long, but it also includes a few little vignettes that the others do not have, such as Simon of Cyrene and the good thief, Jesus promising paradise. You'll just see a few little elements in Luke that Matthew and Mark don't, don't have. It's a, it's a much beloved account and one that people would not have heard on Palm Sunday prior to 1960. So when it comes time for the Passion on Palm Sunday, it is proclaimed without candles and without incense. At the, at the cathedral, our, on a typical Sunday Mass, we have two servers who carry candles over to stand by the ambo for the proclamation of the gospel. They do not do it for the, for the Passion. And on a big day, we would use incense to incense the book that is not to be used for the, for the passion. At the very beginning, you tell right away something is different. The deacon or the priest does not begin with the Lord be with you. And we'll talk about this again when we get to Good Friday, but I think the reason is we're now entering in to the mystery of the death of Christ and the Lord is not with us, so there's no greeting here. His, through his death, we're, we're entering into a time when, when Jesus has, has gone. And there's no signing of the book with the cross so that the proclamation of the mystery of the cross stands out as the, the primary symbol. It may be read by several readers. They like it if the Christ part will be reserved for the priest. This year, we're going to sing the Passion at the cathedral on Good Friday, not on, not on Palm Sunday. And we'll have uh, two other uh, canners with me to, to, to sing. At the end, the, the deacon or the priest does say the gospel of the, of the Lord, but does not kiss the book. Again, these are small details that many priests and deacons miss. So you may well have somebody start with the Lord be with you and kiss the book at the end. It's just that they haven't, it's hard to remember to, to make these little adjustments, but the liturgy asks us to treat the passion differently than we do on other days. That's Palm Sunday. Do you have any Comments, questions on Palm Sunday. Okay, let's look at Holy Thursday's Mass of the Lord's Supper. Just a, a few things about this day you, you may or may not realize, but the, the tabernacle is supposed to be completely empty before the Holy Thursday Mass begins. And when the sacristan is preparing the bread for, for this Mass, they're supposed to prepare enough for the distribution of communion on Good Friday as well. So this time of year, a lot of, a lot of our churches are trying to kind of limit the number of hosts that we keep in the tabernacle so we don't have an excess of them on, on Holy Thursday. Typically, what we do is put them somewhere else. They could be in a separate tabernacle by the altar of repose or something, but they're, they're put somewhere else, not in the main tabernacle. I like to have the doors of the tabernacle open so people know there's nothing in there. The sanctuary lamp that usually 
the, the red candle that indicates the Blessed Sacrament is, is present is usually to be extinguished for, for holy fears. Now, Catholics are, are habit, creatures of habit. So usually when we walk into a church, before you take your pew, what do you do? You genuflect, and your genuflection is aimed at the tabernacle. That, that is what you are. You're reverencing the real presence of Christ in that tabernacle. So on Holy Thursday, if all goes according to plan, there's nothing in the tabernacle, and a genuflection would be totally meaningless when you enter the church on, on Holy Thursday night. You could make a bow to the altar and then, then take your pew. That would be the, the appropriate thing to do. But one of, the, one of the nice things about this is that everybody gets served communion from the altar at this Mass. Everybody, in other words, nobody gets leftovers at this Mass. Okay? All right. So, in, actually, any Mass, the Church urges us not to use the tabernacle breads for the distribution of communion, as if that's the I mean, it is the body of Christ as, as the communion from the altar, but for the integrity of what the Mass is, this offering of a sacrifice and receiving of communion, that the Church hopes that all of us will be able to, to receive communion from the altar. The priest has to. He is obliged to receive communion from the bread and wine he consecrates at that Mass. That He has to do that. And on Holy Thursday, everybody does the same. So you, you get get freshly consecrated bread and wine at, at this Mass every year. The foot washing uh, is optional. The priest does not, does not have to do it, but uh, many of us really, really like this. Uh, we, we, we get a lot of privileges in the priesthood, and I, I think it's good for us once a year to get down on our hands and knees and serve the people serve us so beautifully. So I, I think this is an important message for us to give. Uh, we may remove our chasuble to do this. I, I usually do. It says he pours water over the feet and dries them. It used to be that you would just pull, pull shoe and sock off one foot, but the implication now is he's got to wash both feet of the people who are there. Incidentally, it never says he washes the feet of twelve Almost every parish does 12, but it could be fewer, it could be more. So I, I rather like opening it up to anybody who wants to get their, their feet washed at, at this Mass. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be limited to, to just a few. Uh, but, but anyway, most, most people do 12, but just, you know, it, it doesn't say that anywhere in the, in the book. In the Missal, it suggests some music that may be sung during the washing of the feet. Uh, I know this, this slide doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there are seven antiphons, seven, seven like phrases from, this, from the Bible that may be used for this. When, when we first went to the Revised Liturgy after Vatican II, one of them was dropped, and we just had six of them. And now they've restored it, so we have seven again. And one other thing they did with these antiphons is they they decided to rearrange them and put them in biblical order. Most of them are from John's Gospel. So they now have them in the order in which you find them in, in the Bible. This is a, a lovely thing to reflect on because at the Last Supper, Jesus is not just giving his own body and blood in the sacrament, he's also giving an example of service. So these things are going to fit together. We get fed, but with that feeding, we also serve. We have to, have to do uh, a little of each. Anyway, one of, the, one of the things that we lost when they rearranged the order of the antiphons is that number six of the list today used to be number one, but because of the new way of organizing them, it's no longer number one, it's number six. And in Latin, number six begins with these words, 
a new commandment I give you, says the Lord, that as I have loved you, so you should love me. But in Latin, the first word, the word for commandment, the new commandment, is mandatum. And because that was the first of the antiphons in the old in the old missal, you sometimes hear people refer to the washing of the feet as the mandatum, and you also hear some people refer to Holy Thursday as Monday Thursday. So it's because of that Latin antiphon that that, that was that was carried over. Some of you are communion ministers here. You, you may want to know that uh, the, uh, the only people who may receive communion on Holy Thursday outside of Mass are those who are sick. If, uh, if your parish has a custom of doing an occasional communion service, you may not do one of those on Holy Thursday. You can't have healthy people who are able to get around receive communion outside of Mass on that day. But this is a new instruction at the end of the Mass for Holy Thursday that pertains to the sick. At an appropriate moment during communion, the priest entrusts the Eucharist from the table of the altar to deacons or acolytes or other extraordinary ministers so that afterwards it may be brought to the sick who are to receive Holy Communion at home. So this is saying, yeah, the sick can receive communion on Holy Thursday, but wouldn't it be great if they could receive communion from the bread that was consecrated at the Holy Thursday Mass of the Lord's Supper? So that bread goes into the pixes and to the homes. Everybody then is kind of drawn together, sharing the same meal uh, at, at the Mass of the Lord's Supper. If you do this, you may want to check with the sick before knocking on their door at 9 o'clock at night saying, <laughs> Hi, I'm here. Then a uh, procession forms to bring the, uh, the, the, consecra- the leftover consecrated breads to, the, to a tabernacle and adoration lasts for a little while. The, this music is not obligatory, but it is traditional and it's still recommended. The Pange Lingua and Tantu Mergo. Uh, there are English translations of these that you have sung and, and that you know. Uh, I put this up here just so you, you know this. The church gives a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions for those who sing the Tantu Mergo on Holy Thursday night when the priest or the deacon is putting the putting the Blessed Sacrament into the tabernacle for for adoration. It's one of the few times you get a plenary indulgence by singing. (laughs) And um, and so it's it's a... But but the usual conditions are praying for the Pope, intending not to sin again, going to confession, receiving communion within a a certain amount of time. But this is one of the occasions that, that the Church offers you this if you If you sing, (laughs) then uh, adoration may continue until midnight, and apparently it can go after midnight, but without solemnity. I still haven't figured out what that means, but most of us close up by midnight. At the cathedral, we close up by 10 and uh, and get a a good night's rest after that. Do you have questions about Holy Thursday, comments about the Holy Thursday mass? Can communion ministers get... Who are going to the sick and they pick up the host on Friday and take it to them? Or does it have to be on Thursday night? They may bring communion to the sick on Friday, but not on Holy Saturday. Correct. Yes. So let's talk about Friday. You can be sure that the text of the Tons of America will be in the worship paper. <laughs> so everyone come up here after mass. If you do a good lap, you know right here, <laughs> right where he's standing. So great. Please, please come join us. You can grab your plenary indulgence right here, a week from Thursday night. <laughs> Who else is going to know except for you? <laughs> so, as I mentioned, 
Uh, the full title for Palm Sunday is Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. The full title for Good Friday is Of the Lord's Passion. Every year we're going to hear the Passion according to St. John. That's just a, a part of it. So some things on observing Good Friday. It is a day of fast and abstinence. Fast means you, you only eat one complete meal. And the other two meals are smaller, so that combined they don't equal a meal. The, uh, the law to fast begins at the age of 18. So if you have people in your household younger than that, they are not obliged to fast. Uh, there is an upper limit to fasting, too. Does anybody know what what the ceiling is. Once you once you get beyond this age, you don't have to observe the fast anymore. 59. It's 59. Uh -huh. Once you've reached your 59th birthday. So a lot of you get a free pass. It's one of the, when, you, when you celebrate your 59th birthday, it's one of the gifts the Catholic Church gives you. You can eat as much as you want on Good Friday, but, but you still have to abstain from meat. So the, the law for abstaining from meat begins at 14, and there is no upper limit. So on uh, on Ash Wednesday and all the Fridays of Lent, including Good Friday, we all abstain from meat, even if you are as old as 60. <laughs> you still have to abstain from meat. That's it for, the, for, for all the way up. Penance and anointing of the sick may be celebrated on Good Friday and Holy Saturday, but no other sacraments. I'm I'm still finding priests who don't know this. They are they're doing wedding ceremonies on Saturdays. We, one of our parishes had baptism scheduled on the Holy Saturday morning this year. So we've we've had to jump on all of this. It's it's only penance and anointing of the sick. And actually, prior to 25 years ago, it it, it said no sacraments may be celebrated on Good Friday or Holy Saturday. None of, none of them. And then Pope John Paul II started hearing confessions in St. Peter's Basilica on Good Friday, so they changed the rule. <laughs> and really, this was the custom in many churches that they would do uh, confessions on Good Friday. It would be good, good support for that. But he started doing it, so they, they said that it was still okay to do confessions on that day. And if you participate in the Good Friday liturgy, or go to Stations of the Cross on Good Friday, or watch the Pope do Stations of the Cross on your television, you get a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions again. So if you miss the Tanta Mirabeau, you still have a chance on Good Friday to, uh, to do it. You can get it twice, yeah. Some people need it that often. <laughs> The smartphones count too, right? Yes, yeah, you can watch it on your smartphone. Funerals may be celebrated on Good Friday, but without Mass and without communion. So this, sadly, this doesn't happen every so often. I, I, uh, I remember uh, a year when I was pastor of, of St. Regis, we had over the Palm Sunday weekend, four parishioners died, oh and we had we had funerals on uh, I think it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Wow! So the Thursday and Friday funerals were without mass, and uh, and actually it worked out fine. Everybody understood they they all heard what had happened to us, you know, as if they they didn't have enough sorrow. But uh, but I think in one one case the family was kind of relieved they they didn't have too many people active with the church and communion was going to be an embarrassment anyway so they were they were fine with it but just so you know if there is a funeral in your family and the priest says I can't do a mass on that day he's he's not pulling your leg uh, holy communion outside the uh, the liturgy the official liturgy can only be given to the sick. 
appearance of the church, uh, the altar is supposed to be completely bare. So it should look quite empty. So, when yes. did they start funerals without mass or communion? Because I know in 1969, my husband's grandpa, we had mass and communion. On Good Friday? Uh, for a funeral. We had tuna at the thing. Wow, wow. <laughs> but I know it was a mass. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. And of course, 1969 was a year when a lot of rules were changing. So uh -huh. it, uh, I don't think you have to go back and do it over again. <laughs> but, uh, but it wouldn't, have, yeah, it wouldn't have surprised me if somebody said, "Oh, it's fine. We'll just do it." Yeah, you know how priests are. Sometimes they don't follow the rules. And, uh, so, yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. At the opening, the priest deacon he can go to the altar, reverence said, prostrate or kneel, and all kneel, pray in silence. Uh, this is Pope Francis. He still goes prostrate onto the uh, onto the ground for the, the beginning of the Good Friday liturgy. I think it's one of the most solemn penitential beginnings that any liturgy that that we do. It procession comes in in silence and the ministers lie down in the, in the sanctuary for uh, a few moments of silent prayer while we meditate on the on the death of Christ I've already talked about the passion the only difference is that it's John instead of Luke uh, another key part of the ceremony is the adoration of the cross and I'm sure you've all had some experience of this where you come up in procession to a cross. You're supposed to use just one cross no matter how big the congregation is. If it's so big you can't get everybody up there that a few people come to show their their respect and then the priest lifts the cross and everybody else can worship from a distance and then set it down. That's, that's what they have to do at the Vatican. You couldn't possibly get everybody to kiss one, one cross. Anyway, I'm going to quote, I'll give you a couple of quotes um, from church history because when the English translation changed uh, a few years back, you know things like the Lord be with you and also that you changed to the Lord be with you and with your spirit. But there, was, there were a lot of other changes and one of them was what you call this moment in the Good Friday liturgy. For years we were calling it the veneration of but the word in Latin, plain as day, is adoratio. It is called the adoration of the cross. And it is an absolute head scratcher because we adore God. We adore Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. We don't even say that we adore Mary. This, so what is it to adore a, a cross? What does, what does that mean? I, I, I think it is something that has a very deep meaning in that we only use this word on Good Friday in reference to the cross. But remember the church is, is empty of a tabernacle. There's no real presence of Christ around. So the cross as the instrument of our salvation becomes the object of our adoration. If you, if you think of it as the cross being the object that received the blood of Christ, that in a sense first drank the blood of Christ and, and was stained with, with that blood, then you could kind of see where as during benediction you adore the body of Christ in the monstrance, so on Good Friday you adore the blood of Christ on, on the cross. That might be a, a way of, of thinking about it. Amalarius from the 12th century, I think, says, uh, although not every church can possess the true cross, nevertheless, the power of the Holy Cross is not absent in those crosses that were made in the likeness of the Lord's cross. So he's saying, even if you don't have a relic of the true cross in your church, if you have any cross, at least on Good Friday, that cross is invested with the power of the cross of, of Jesus Christ, and it deserves our, our respect. St. Thomas of 
Aquinas wrote that the cross is worshipped with the same adoration as Christ. So he's thinking of uh, this, to say, this instrument of our salvation that was so critical becomes the object of our devotion, more than our devotion, something we can actually adore. So as I say, uh, stay with, with the blood of Christ. The word adore in reference to the cross is unique to this day. You'll see at the very end of the Good Friday service that the ministers who might normally genuflect to the tabernacle before they leave after Mass, genuflect to the cross. And think about the, the words that you sing. Um, the, the deacon or the priest sings, Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the, the Savior of the world. And everybody answers, Come, let us adore. So we speak about, we sing about adoring the wood of, of the cross. Yeah, here, here are the text. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung, come let us adore. And then there's another line that goes, we adore your cross, O Lord. These are very strong words for us to hear and to sing, but they are a, a part of the way that we, uh, that we recognize the, the power of the cross. So I, I summarize it this way. You're not adoring the image of Jesus on a crucifix. You are adoring the wood of the cross. So, it, it, the, a lot of people wonder then, what are, you know, are you supposed to do? Show a cross or a crucifix? I'll come to that in just just a moment. But I want you to see the uh, the two different ways of showing the cross for the adoration. In the first form, you you take a cross in the sanctuary, and the priest or the deacon. It's covered, and they uncover one branch at a time while you sing, Behold the wood of the, wood of the cross. It's supposed to be a violet veil that covers the cross because in the gospel they talk about mocking Jesus by clothing him in purple garments uh, at, just before his crucifixion. This, I think, is a picture from one of the Vatican ceremonies. It says right in the book you're supposed to use a violet veil, and they have a red veil. <laughs> the... Uh, the second form, you process the cross unveiled through, through the church. So you start at the back and then work your way up, up to the front. Some people do form 1.5, you know, where they, they do both. They pr process it up and uncover a little bit of it, but it's really supposed to be one or the, or the other. And then for the showing and the adoration, uh, chasuble and shoes may be removed. Uh, People may genuflect, kiss, do, bow to the altar, do whatever they want. There's no rule on how you adore the cross. You just come do it your way. So, as I say, sometimes people are wondering, well, then, are we supposed to use a cross or are we supposed to use a crucifix? And some churches have only used a crucifix. The Vatican continues to use a crucifix. I'm, I'm personally leaning toward cross just because I think it ties the vocabulary of Good Friday together a little bit better. Remember, we're, we're adoring the wood, not the image of Jesus, but the, but the wood upon which he, he died. But there are strong traditions around using the, a crucifix on, on that night, so there's, there's no easy answer to, to what best to do. Um, then at communion time, there's a Lord's Prayer, the priest has a private prayer, and it says that Psalm 22, uh, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That, that is the psalm that may be sung during communion, or some other chant may be sung, or nothing may be sung. You can do communion completely in silence. There's, there's no required uh, music at, at this particular communion uh, in, in this celebration. Comments or questions on Good Friday? Yeah. No problem, too. There's no sign of peace, no. Because this is not a liturgy of the Eucharist. Just like there's no Lamb of God, there's no breaking of the bread. The bread has already been broken from Holy Thursday. And I, I mentioned earlier that on, on Palm Sunday, to begin the Passion, you don't say the Lord be with you. I, 
if you look at the Good Friday liturgy, that's true throughout. There's, there's no greeting at the beginning. It was like the priest usually begins side of the cross and the Lord be with you, but on Good Friday, you don't. You just begin, the first thing you hear is the prayer, the opening prayer of that Mass. Same thing with the Passion. There's no Lord be with you at the beginning. Of course, there's no Eucharistic prayer, so there won't be a Lord be with you to begin the, the preface dialogue. The only other one is at the end of Mass, before the blessing. And so I, I conclude from that, you shouldn't say the Lord be with you before giving those two prayers of blessing, but the prayer over the people at the end. I think the, the message is, the Lord is not with us. In Latin, the words dominus lobiscum, could mean the Lord is with you as much as the Lord be with you. So just to eliminate any confusion on that, it, it's removed. When the bishop presides, this is the only uh, major celebration of the year that he removes his ring for, for the celebration. He does, does, does the whole uh, service without his ring on. When he first receives the ring in becoming a bishop, there's a reference to the passage about Christ as the bridegroom. And so the, the ring is kind of a symbol of Christ the, the bridegroom, but there's a passage, uh, Jesus himself says, uh, you know, there, there will come a time when the bridegroom is not with you. And so in reference to that, the ring is gone for the, for the good Friday celebration. Well, yep. Yeah, I think regarding your comment on during the adoration of the cross, whether it's a crucifixion or cross. Yeah. Well, we thought it would be a cross because it's after the reading of the Passion, right? And Jesus was then removed from the cross. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. He is in the tomb, and the cross is left behind. Let's look at some things from the Easter Vigil. The Mass is supposed to begin after nightfall, and there are lots of interpretations about when this is supposed to begin. Um, because, as you know, Easter can spill over a four or five week period. Sometimes it's before or after daylight savings time has begun, so it's hard to know if it's dark enough to start. I'm, I'm kind of more flexible than many on this. I'm, I'm of the view that if you've turned on lamps in your house, and if cars have turned on headlights on the streets, then maybe it's time to light a fire. <laughs> so I, I would say it doesn't have to be pitch black outside, but dark enough that a fire can be struck that will shatter the, the darkness of, of the night. It says, a blazing fire is prepared. I used to get Boy Scouts to do this for me when I was at St. Regis, because... They knew how to build a fire. <laughs> they were, they were really good. Uh, the deacon or the priest sings the, or even a canter can sing the light of Christ at the door. When the, uh, the priest's candle is lighted in the aisle, when the people's candles are lighted, and then again in the sanctuary. And uh, this is one of the most ignored rubrics, instructions in all of, of the Catholic Church. After the third time that the deacon sings the light of Christ, all the lights in the church are supposed to come on. Most, most churches, they're singing the exulta in the dark while everybody's holding their, their candles. But the, uh, but the design is that it's all flush with, with light, and you're, the, the, the deacon is singing the praises of the candle that has illuminated everything, even by golly, the electrical lights in this church. The, can the candle has just turned everything into its, its ultimate brightness. For the uh, exultet itself, the Easter proclamation, a deacon incenses the book. Uh, he may sing it at the ambo or at a lectern. I always urge them to choose the ambo. You can only use the ambo for a few things, and this is one of them. Uh, someone else may sing it. A priest may sing it, a con celebrant may do it, a lay cantor may do it, but it, traditionally it's, it's a deacon. This is a medieval graphic over here showing a, 
a custom they had of singing, the deacon singing the exultet way up high. Now, there's no sound amplification, no microphone, so you have to get up high to let your voice be heard. And then he had the whole chant on a scroll that he would, he would sing from. And there, there was a tradition to decorate the scroll, what would appear to be upside down, so that as he throws it over the top, while he's singing all these notes, you'd have like a, a movie of the, the different aspects of, of salvation history that he's, that he's singing about. You can still see some of these in, in museums. Pisa has a beautiful one from the 11th century. For the readings, I don't know what your custom is at St. Mark's, but the instruction is all nine readings should be proclaimed whenever this can be done for the, for the vigil. But you may reduce it to as many as three Old Testament readings. I should have made that a little bit clearer. Um, if so, they have to come from both the law and the prophets. So both from Genesis, Exodus, that, that part of salvation history, as well as Isaiah, Ezekiel, some of that. You can't just do one, one side or the other. You're supposed to get a sense of the sweep of, of salvation history moving through it all. We have them all, by the way. Do you? Yeah. And, and there are a couple of psalms. <coughs> I think that's... Not, and not every verse of every psalm, but it's all... That's very good. Yeah. The Vatican does not, and I wish they did. We, we do them all. Then, uh, when, the, when the Gloria comes, the bells are rung and the altar candles are lighted. This is a, it was kind of an old custom about, um, they, used, they used to say the Mass began with the Gloria on, on, on the Easter Vigil, but everything else prior to it was like a warm up. That was the Vigil. <laughs> And then the Mass began with the Gloria. Now they're saying, no, 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 it's all Mass. And, but, but this is a holdover from it where they still light altar candles when, when you sing the, the Gloria. Now I want to point this out about the renewal of baptismal promises because this is kind of my own read of this, but I think I'm, I think I'm on target. You know how the Lent has two different, two different journeys going on. You've got catechumens who are now elect, preparing for their baptism at the Easter Vigil. And you've got faithful Christians who are using Lent to kind of keep an eye on them, but also to be inspired by their spiritual renewal and to get renewed at the same time. You're both heading toward Easter. At the Easter Vigil, the elect are going to be asked to make their baptismal promises for the very first time. You are going to be asked to renew your baptismal promises as you do every year. So just as they are on this track, through Lent, they're studying the creed, they're getting scrutinies, they're, they're trying to get themselves ready for baptism, they're going to be asked that night, one-on-one, -on -one, do you renounce Satan? Did the scrutiny take effect? Do you believe? Did you study your, your creed? And they will answer, I do, I do, I do, and then into the water they go. And I think, similarly for us, we have gone through this Lent doing our penance, doing charity, trying to come about with a spiritual renewal. So now we come to Easter, and we're being asked to renew our promises also. Do you renounce the sin you've been trying to get over? Do you believe in Christ? ready to re-up your commitment again and we all say I do, I do, I do. So if you're going through a Lent, uh, having a, a spiritual Lent, you're kind of aiming toward those baptismal promises at the Easter Vigil. It's, it's that night when you kind of bring all this to a head and recommit yourself to Christ. And if you go to the Easter Vigil and renew your promises that night, you get another plenary indulgence. <laughs> Three in a row. Okay. Uh, so, this is a question I sometimes get. Yes, Stephen? It's the fourth one. Fourth one. Fourth one. Oh, is it? Tom DeMerigo. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, oh. Dayton. Yeah. The, the, uh, the celebration of Good Friday yeah. itself. 
and now the renewal of baptismal promises. All right. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, so sometimes people ask me, okay, so this is a long ceremony. When does Christ arise? When is the moment that we are actually celebrating the resurrection of Jesus? Is it with the fire? Is it when they sing the exultant? Is it when they sing the Alleluia for the first time? Is it the proclamation of the gospel where you hear the news, Jesus is risen? Is it in the baptisms where you're seeing people rise uh, from, from the waters into new life? Is it in communion when we, at the Easter Vigil, for the first time now in the, in the Easter season, we experience the risen Christ in the form of the sacrament of, of the Eucharist? When, when does Christ arise? And the answer is, yes. <laughs> so it's kind of like you know, the e Easter Vigil just keeps brimming over with this with this news again and again and again. So it's, it's not like one moment is, is happening here, but the, the news of the resurrection is so happy and so profound that it's all over the place. And we just we celebrate it that night. I find that many Catholics have heard the Easter Vigil is long and late, and they're not going. They're going to go Easter Sunday morning. And once in a while, someone who does go through the Easter Vigil, has never experienced it before, says to me, that was really amazing. Now, tell me, Father, does, does this count for, for Easter Sunday? <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, you just went through all of this, you had to ask that question. I, I said, I'm being facetious here, but, but I want to ask, if you skip the Easter Vigil and go to Mass on, only on Easter Sunday morning, does that count? That's my question. And of course it, it does, but the Easter Vigil is just rich in symbolism. I, I keep saying if there's one Mass Catholics should commit to every year, it's this one. It is the Easter Vigil. It is the, the time we sacrifice to stay up late. We're so excited about this good news of the resurrection, we literally cannot sleep. We've got to get to church celebrate the great news of the resurrection there. Questions about the Easter Vigil? Okay, a word from our sponsor. I did write two books uh, that you may you might want to know about. Uh, what am I doing for Trudelum this year is a little booklet that costs about a buck, buck and a half. And uh, it's a do-it-yourself retreat for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday gets you to think about the symbols, think about the scripture readings, and help yourself along. If you really like the geeky stuff on how these liturgies go together, then Glory of the Cross is a book that will take you inch by inch through the celebrations of Holy Week, more than you would ever want to know, but some people find that, that kind of material well, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for the invitation to come. Yeah, I am, I'm, I'm delighted you can take these days this week to kind of do a Lenten mission, a Lenten, a Lenten retreat, and get yourselves ready for the making the, the most of the year's best days because they're coming right up in, in just another week. Let's show them our gratitude.